All right, guys. We could use more panelists, guys, so chime in. Just us two so far? Uh, the others are shy, I think. But I, I could see, like, Andrew and Burak join as well. That would be awesome. Olga is there. Thanks, Olga. Cool. Um, so yeah, <laughs> Reed brought up the, the elephant in the room, and I, I hinted to, to it in my introduction thing. Um, how about HPC, traditional HPC schedulers, and why have we included it into the slide deck? I mean, I have an opinion, but maybe you guys want to, like, get first, go first. Um, so, so is the question the integration of uh, orchestration software to use those schedulers, or is it just why aren't we talking about HPC schedulers anyway? No, the, the question Reid posed it was, why do we need all this new orchestration uh, stuff when we already have mature resource managers for HPC? Why not educate those existing tools about whatever extra stuff is needed for containers? Um, from my perspective is we're trying to adopt or use the systems to uh, execute cloud native workflows. So the portability of using those uh, existing workflows and bringing them to the HPC resources is, is, is one of the paramount questions here. And without the recasting of those deployments into traditional workload manager um, scheduler frameworks, we don't want to do that really. We just want to, you know, uh, port and go um, and improve the sort of the whole developer experience. So um, using using orchestration or cloud native software, I think is an important part of HPC workflows moving forward. Um, the other thing I'd like to bring up though is we're not saying one or the other. It's, it's systems should be able to um, use uh, as many frameworks as, as users want to. Right, so it's the it's the ability to run any workload of, in any language on an HPC resources. I I would just add that you know life doesn't have to be a batch. There's I said that tongue in cheek, but there's more that we could do than representing the entire world. That is you know our computational uh, requirements as a job uh, that, that is batched together. There's there's more interesting things that we can do. So obviously, you know, some of the new Kubernetes orchestration services and all the other, um, you know, the, the many different tools that Eduardo mentioned uh, play to that. I think a, a notion of a job and using batch is important, but it's not the only thing. And workflows would stand to benefit from doing things that weren't just in a batch format. So I think that's my simple answer. I think another topic which was which was brought up earlier in the conference was orchestration software allows us to define more rigorously the runtime environment. So uh, we can define networks, we can define storage, we can define uh, architecture um, so so you know in a way that that is a, a more encompassing runtime deployment than existing workload managers uh, because we have that flexibility and and we can hook into that, that infrastructure to do so yeah another thing I would like to add is the I would say like the industrial point of view of HPC is HPC for the industry is really AI ML, right? Like that's all that mostly they are doing. And these tools have been built from, from the base ground to run on Kubernetes, right? So all these tools leveraging today, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and all this AI ML tooling, they are built to be run on Kubernetes on top of an orchestration tool, right? And then we cannot say, oh, I can then modify that to run in Slurm, to run that in a regular HPC ecosystem. So there are tools that are being developed from the from scratch to be run on Kubernetes. So there is the need, as Shane is saying in, in the chat, 
that some researchers are going to come to the HPC systems with a Kubernetes native job, right? And we need to be able to be flexible to attend both worlds. And I like what uh, Jonathan was saying is, for me, there is a way on which we could have HPC like basic jobs, and also we can do a cloud native orchestration. So we, we should be looking towards having a system that can be flexible enough to attend both kind of users. Yeah, I see the same thing that we need to, to find a way to bring those silos together and all combined in, yeah, um, or yeah, satisfying both user groups needs and in industry um, pointing out to Eduardo, it's not just machine learning um, as um, who was it, Shane, I think. Um, no, I don't know. Um, Kenos was it um, that uh, industry not, is not only machine learning. Um, for for from my example, I see lots of um, engineering um, workloads running in traditional MPI base on an InfiniBand um, systems, but these are now also starting to bring in a bit of machine learning. But I also know of user groups who are doing their their training for for machine learning based on traditional. Uh, HPC um, yeah, environments due to the fact that uh, because of the history they're coming in this way, this batch oriented uh, processing um, type here. Yeah, but reading from Bill's gaps and challenges slide, you, you said like different security paradigms are clashing here, like ABAC, ABAC and POSIX for traditional HPC um, schedulers. Can we serve the needs of like notebooks or like service-like sidecar stuff that we we or that customers want for for their workloads? Can we can we even do this with with Slurm or with with the traditional schedulers if we want to have a notebook somewhere? That's not possible, right? Is it? I mean, there's there's a gap there. Um, yeah, there there are a lot of ways. Like I remember last supercomputing at the Northwestern University stand, they were showcasing how to run kind of like orchestrating Jupyter notebooks with this learn. And it was a really awesome demo. So there is a way on which you can like go deep down on this learn basics and you can run services. Andrew, you wanted to say something or Bill? Yeah, the, the, you know, I think the point I was trying to make there is is that the cloud native type of authentication models um, are not exactly the same as as the HBC POSIX type of models. Even though there are lots of hooks and bridges, right? So so um, RBAC can be interfaced with LDAP, and, and and we can authenticate users that way. It's it's not exactly quite the same, and especially when we talk about storage. So the POSIX types of storage permissions don't really translate very well to S3 buckets or Azure um, uh, blobs. So there is work there to, to be done in, in some of this bridging the gaps, right? So the authentication models is one where we have to start thinking about how to bridge gaps if we're using um, the Kubernetes or cloud native type software to, to POSIX systems um, storage, Permissions is you know is another one not quite the same. It's, it's the same story with it. good old HDFS and, and POSIX before. So there are some challenges. Um, I think we'll get there. Uh, right now, there's a lot of bailing wire and duct tape to make those services work together. Um, I think as we move forward, hopefully the the two communities can get together and start coming out with better APIs or more consistent ways of doing uh, processes. So. Um, yes, uh, I think that was yeah that was what I was trying to go with the with the different authentication models. But I mean, if someone else has a, a comment on that, but I, I I will pause for a minute or for a second. I think what the question is like: Do are we going down the same HPC path that we adopt something and then we do our own thing with it? Like to be the devil's advocate here. I mean, is it do we need to convince the non-HPC Kubernetes community to do it our way, to lose Slurm, I think that's that we cannot achieve, right? I mean, I think we rather schmooze up to them and, and show them 
how to do HPC with with those uh, with more modern schedulers, right? And and the pace of innovation within Kubernetes and within the container ecosystem, as we saw with our runtimes uh, as well, is much higher. So I think there's no chance of them using Slurm, but maybe more chance of us using Kubernetes. Or is it too provocative? Well, so, uh, there. Go ahead, Eduardo. I was going to it. mention the, the the Andrew point of view of this, like the community point of view is, even if we try to push Slurm to the Kubernetes ecosystem, for for the Kubernetes ecosystem, for the industry, having more than a thousand nodes is something super weird and like, wow, what are you doing with 1,000 nodes? On the HPC ecosystem, 1,000 nodes is just like your login system. So the Kubernetes, yeah, it is moving at a very fast pace. It is being developed at a very fast pace. But since there is no need to move away from 1,000 nodes, that's not a, even a need. Right, so this is why we as a community need to tell them, hey, if you cannot give me one more than 1,000 nodes with Kubernetes, this is why I'm proposing this X, Y, G. So I was going to say that, Andrew. But Kubernetes is tested on, on 5,000 nodes, right? That's the current state of Kubernetes testing. Yeah, but that was a long stretch and... And I think that's an architectural limit, right? It's not... Um... Yep. There's, there's things in there which which don't scale past 5,000, even though there's a SIG group, I think, based on uh, or, or trying to scale out Kubernetes. But it's, uh, yeah, as Eduardo was saying, it's really 1,000 node less for stable clusters. So like the interesting part is is uh, getting Kubernetes and your favorite scheduler, Slurm or whatever, to each do its own job, each do what it's good at. Uh, you know, use uh, Kubernetes for the sake of reliability, for services and bringing things back up and managing things uh, at the edge or in a distributed environment uh, and still letting Slurm uh, sort of do a great job of what people are used to having it do inside the pod, for example. So a lot of that has yet to be proven out, but I think there are more opportunities there. I think I think it really depends by the workload. If you need to to deploy a real HPC workload, you may need to to prefer Slurm or similar best scheduler. But <clears throat> in the case you have just a need to 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 parallelize a, a large data set computation, you can uh, you can even use Kubernetes or cloud cluster like I don't know AWS Bash or other similar technology. So it depends what what you need to 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 deploy. Andrew. So to build on that really, um, you know, it's important to remember that HPC is significantly different in terms of requirements and, and the code that we run, these large scale single app simulations exactly. on thousands of nodes. That's completely different from what the cloud world sees, which is about exactly. managing many small but independent tasks. So inherently, we have in, in the HPC community a fundamentally different problem than the cloud. Now, that doesn't mean we can't borrow and use the same tools, but of course, there's going to be differences in modifications, such as we are going to care more about our batch scheduler, for instance, right? Now, to CJ's point, I think that's partially correct. The caveat to that is resource management needs to be of a single mind, and, and having I believe I'm stealing from from Bill here, but the split split mind mentality when it comes to resource management can be really dangerous. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think we should be using things that are good at actual batch scheduling for that task because calling, you know, how Kubernetes does anything that looks like a job, a modern scheduling system is pretty generous, but. Um, at least compared to the HPC world, but you're right. We should be able to intertwine these a little more, so long as we maintain single ownership of resource management. But isn't this the the one of the problems that HPC centers they have, or not the problem? They have a different scaling issue, right? If you if you you have a set number of nodes for like five years or so, and you need to make sure that those nodes are used the best way, you prioritize. You have different queues. You try to make sure that it's used best. And for the cloud, you just say, I, I need 1,000 nodes, so I create a new cluster, an ephemeral cluster, even with 1,000 nodes. And after this is done, then I kick it. 
I don't need to prioritize. I don't need to have them on the shared system. I can have many um, systems that are running just one job, and then I I just uh, kick the kick the the cluster and off I go. Right. So that's the main difference, right, in in perception and scheduling. And I don't think HPC has all the answers. Let me be very clear on that. I, I, again, I don't like the batch is the only way to, to do things, right? I don't think it's a good model, and I think we need to evolve beyond that. But that doesn't mean we have to totally throw it out, start from scratch either. So, yeah, I was going to base a, a question on uh, on uh, uh, Christian there. So, so this notion of self serve, how far do you want to push that, right? So, the cloud self serve model is on one end of the spectrum, and HPC data centers are sort of in the middle. You, you know, you, yes, you've got containers now to give you OS differentiation, but you're basically running the same scheduler as what the sysadmins want you to do, and it's the same, basically the same OS type of thing. So, um, we're not we're not really addressing any of the self serve issues here. We're just talking about different orchestrators and how to bring that sort of model to HPC. Um, I guess a question that, that that I have for the panelists, I guess, is is ultimately in you know 2025, where you know where do you see job launch or orchestration going? Is it more towards the cloud self serve model where I as a user get to define everything? Or is it somewhere in the middle? Well, I want to jump there. So my 2025 view of this is, as I, was, I, as I said in my talk, I see Kubernetes as the system admin of the HPC system, right? So you will still have your HPC scheduler, but you will live and you will rely on Kubernetes for all the system administration, right? So they, they say in, on Twitter, this joke of Kubernetes is the system D for distributed clusters, right? So we should be looking at, at Kubernetes as that on the HPC ecosystem, right? So Kubernetes is the system D of my cluster, but I still will have my slur, my LSF, my whatever living underneath, but Kubernetes is going to be that API for everyone, like ops and developers, to interact with my cluster. So Kubernetes will be what we know today as the crappy, angry system admin. Uh, Kubernetes will become that. So that's my 2025 view of HPC. Maybe more kernel than system D, hopefully, because system D has. I mean, Bill can maybe comment, but I would say that's maybe not even a 2025 thing. I think we may see that sooner. <laughs> but I also think that we there's use cases where you don't want it to be purely a system and thing. Users have their own definitions of things. And so I think how we bring those two together is the, still the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't then. Uh, a chance for us to, same as in runtimes, to be to become more relevant in in the non-HPC ecosystem by schmoozing up to them even and and uh, put HPC in AIML like uh, in Kubeflow, these nice little things that are out there. I mean, AIML is is not done on. I mean, it's also done on HPC systems, but I I would think that the majority of HPC like AIML workloads are more driven towards those Kubernetes uh, kind of scheduling pieces, right? And if we want to be relevant there, then we cannot just build our own castle again. Can we? And that's provocative, I think. Well, I think that, that you know, that, that, that went into the initial talk here, right? So we want to be able to, to uh, support a diverse set of workflows. And whether those workflows are traditional HPC, or whether they're ML, or maybe they're this new hybrid, you know, ML-driven simulations, right? They, the, the infrastructure needs to support that. And, the, you know, right now there's, there's two competing technologies. There's the cloud-native orchestrated way of doing it, and there's the HPC-native batch systems. So as a, as a system provider, we have to provide systems that can um, run both of those workloads. Um, the other thing I picked up from yesterday was this talk about 
containers v orchestration and where should the conversation be? Um, I'm in the orchestration camp because I think in the next few years, more and more of the infrastructure or decision or steering will be up in the orchestrator level, whether it's workflow driven or the, or the, work, or the actual the orchestration of resources. Um, so, you know, naturally, I think our, our platforms have to move towards that. Um, and, and the scalability of the HPC schedulers is very important to the HPC crowd. And I think the orchestration layers need to somehow interface or make use of that model because the Kubernetes scheduler is, is, is pretty simplistic in the way it allocates resources. So there's work there, there's work in bridging the gap. Um, so I, I think that's the next challenge is, is how, to, how to bring this all together and make it useful. So, can yeah, I wanted to comment on this. I think your remark, Bill, and what um, what Christian said earlier, which was I, I don't think we addressed, is an important one. So, if the assumption is like my resource is infinite, and if a job comes along, I just allocate more and run it, then the scheduling can be pretty simple because it doesn't have to make a lot of decisions. I think what makes HPC systems, you know, typical in HPC environment is there's more work than there is resource. And so you, uh, you have to make decisions about what you schedule next. And I think that um, I could see that even for cloud customers, maybe that eventually becomes a consideration for them. And so that may be the place where, Christian, to your question of like where we could help lead in the cloud native kind of community is talk about scenarios where you need to have um, more sophisticated scheduling, you know, policies and choices and prioritization. Yep, yeah. because sometimes your users know best how to most efficiently run the app. HPC has always been that way. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if ML quickly moved down that route as you see very large distributed you know, neural net training, um, you know, framework, so. But, and, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I just wanted, to, like, like we said in the runtime piece, um, I think we have the, again, we have the opportunity to, to influence and show our strengths in how we optimize for certain environments, how we are able to optimize for certain micro architectures or accelerators and such. So we can also include this, the secret sauce that all the traditional HPC schedulers have in interacting not only with the underlying system, but also interacting with the application and, and being the secret sauce of everything. That, that's something that we can bring to the table and say, look, we know the runtime piece. We know a bit or two about scheduling at scale and how to optimize scheduling. So like to change point, I mean, I think we can influence and make a contribution so that the non-HPC scheduling is also something that appeals to us and that we can also enable others to use. I mean, HPC, if you want to, and now I'm opening another question, but if we want to make smaller customers, smaller use cases, smaller universities, or even like the John Doe at home use HPC, then we also need to lower the barrier of entry. And I think Kubernetes is easier to get started with than Slurm, right? And that's at a certain, certain point. Okay, but this is not if you're not going to install it. The point is, is that really needed? The meaning that they are two completely different models. Because if you think, uh, yeah, HPC or traditional HPC cluster, what they do, they need to manage, they need to optimize the, the allocation of the resources because you have finite resources. So that is the, the challenge. When you are shifted to native cloud, you, there you potentially you have infinite resources. So there the problem is to maximize the prioritization, the throughput. So you don't you, you don't need any more to to try to to allocate the, 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 the best combi combination of the resources because you just want to, to to run as much as possible. So they are two 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 two, two different models that, that does not fit in the, in the same way. But the you know the question I guess is if you're running cloud native software on a on-prem 
system, you're still system constraint, right? You can't, you know, so, so one yes. of the is cloud bursting, right? But you, you only have one. Yeah, 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 you can do, but in my opinion, that is just a transitory period to until all these workload move to the cloud. Well, I might disagree a little bit there because uh, one trend that we are looking at this year is that even Google, and I, I don't, like, you can speak by Amazon, Christian, uh, everyone was thinking that everyone, everything was going to become 100% cloud, like even HPC. But now even Google is selling, like, you can install the Google Container Engine on-prem, right? So they are realizing that on-prem is valuable, like everyone wants to go back to on-prem and everyone wants to have this specialized hardware, like this NVIDIA kind of DGX and stuff like that on-prem, but with the user interface of Google Container Engine, of Amazon Container Engine. So now cloud providers are turning the, their eyes into on-prem, into data centers back again. And this is like I'm on the Kubernetes ecosystem I can see how KubeBash, KubeFlow, and all these projects are gaining and gaining more traction because all of a sudden, doing bash scheduling in Kubernetes became important. So I would say that the word that we have repeating, like everyone has mentioned this word here, is bash, right? Like if we can make Kubernetes better at bash scheduling, we, we are going to be giving like a step forward on this ecosystem. Yeah, I think I agree. I, I agree as well, but I think the, the, the problem I I faced for a long time and I still face is like the traditionalist HPC customers, they want to have the same look and feel as they are used to for like the last 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So they want to, to stay in their comfort zone and they don't want to adopt. And this is of course also a provocative thought, but they don't want to adopt. And my my challenge always is, so my, my thought process is always, how much do I want to make them feel easy by just not adopting to the new world? And how much do I want them to, how, how much do I want them to, to be forced to adopt new technologies and, and change the way they do things? Because of course, of course we can hide the complexity of containers by putting a Docker run into an alias or Singularity run or, or Saros run into an alias so that they don't even know about it. but I think that might not be a, a good way of doing things. I think we should maybe disrupt to some degree how we do things and not try to to schmooze up to people that um, that that just want to nothing to to change. And I like schmooze. Like I, I learned that put it in my active vocabulary like recently. So sorry for that. I would say your argument is broken because we have Paolo right here and tools like NetFlow, they are gaining traction because users want to run things faster, easier, and HPC wants new tools that are good, like are designed to run in a better way in a different language, right? Like, uh, I wouldn't say that HPC don't wanna change because if HPC doesn't wanna change, then why NextFlow is such a good tool and why NextFlow has such a big community? Right. So Nomics is not traditional HPC, right? I mean, they are, or Paolo, what, what, what yeah, yeah, the point is the HPC is really a niche. There is uh, an abuse of the term on um, people that think that they are using, a, and they are doing HPC, but it's not HPC. For example, NextFlow is quite adopted, but it's not doing HPC at all. It's just a, a embarrassing prioritization. Yeah. Uh, and that is the point. There is a huge need to just massively parallelize workload. And most of the time, we stop that and we run into adaptation. It's not real HPC. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think you would be surprised how few true HPC users and analysts actually want, say, Slurm directly. I mean, it's what they know. Yes. So it's what they use, and they've learned how to hack it to their specific needs. 
But I think it's a larger, if you build it, it's a classic infrastructure problem of if you build it, will they come? And, and if you're going to offer something else, it's got to be production on get go from the scratch. And they basically need to be able to translate what they were doing yesterday into what, you know, we think they should be doing today. And that takes a little bit of time and a whole lot of engineering and plumbing. And that, that doesn't happen overnight. But I don't think there's a whole lot of people who are really clamoring for Slurm. They know how to run five, you know, five, 10,000 node jobs in that situation and get their work done. That, that's, the, that's why they use yeah. it. But it's not because they really I, like the interface, trust me. I Just mean, to you, echo that, users I'm, oh, usually don't. Here. Sorry, um, users typically don't want you to, to directly interfere with Slurm. You usually have like another layer of abstraction, some submit scripts or something that do everything the needs the, the user wants to 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 have in the end. And then in the end, his job will be submitted to Slurm, but um, he doesn't really care what 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 he is if he is really using Slurm or LSF. He just wants his job to run basically. Shane? Yeah, I would say, yeah, just it's probably worthwhile to kind of separate out the tools we use to kind of schedule and manage the resources and how the users interact with those and then the inherent kind of requirements of their application. So if I've got a big modeling code that's an MPI code, you know, the requirement is like I need to run it at some scale to get, you know, possibly to just even have it work, right? And so that's, you know, an inherent part of the workload itself. Um, you know, a user goes to a facility, they're running, you know, batch resource manager X, Y, Z, and they do what they need to to translate that requirement to that manager. Um, I, I think that, you know, if uh, we could easily, if Kubernetes had all the right um, capabilities to do the scheduling and policy kind of choices, it would be trivial to make something that would take a Slurm script and convert it to some kind of you know, YAML file. I don't think that's the hard part. I think the problem right now is like, there's just a gap between what we need for these kind of mixed workloads and what's available. I'd agree. You know, I wanna add something to the 2025 vision and I'm super happy that I saw Argo in a HPC uh, workshop because I do see GitOps as something very important in the HPC ecosystem in the years to come, right? Like, uh, and this is a, and one Andrew's talk from last year. Is like, I really want to see users just doing a Git push and everything happening after that, right? Like that is the most user-friendly we can do for HPC users is abstracting everything to the level that is just a Git push and everything will happen and then they can go and check some Grafana dashboard, or they can just go and check like an output folder where their output will live on. But if we can put GitHub uh, as a central, I would say layer of communication for HPC, that is a 2025 vision I would like to see. And on, to, to double click on that, I mean, not only like GitOps, but also all the, the nice um, tracing and logging and monitoring capabilities that come with this more, with, with Kubernetes and all this, this uh, ecosystems that are non HPC. I think that's maybe something that we can attract um, H old HPC users with by saying, okay, look, you, you, you're not using Slurm, but you also don't need to tail the log file. You just have your log, your log stash, you, you have your tracing, you can see dependencies and you can see graphs and you can you can have a better insight of what's going on and have also something that NERSC has like this, uh, what is it called chain, this cluster of services that people can submit jobs to, to monitor or interact with their uh, batch scheduler with. I mean, it's also very attractive, right? It is attractive. Anyhow, okay, <laughs> okay, cool. Um, something else that uh, Theophilus was was asking, and I think that's also worth mentioning. Um, we don't talk about ISVs and how their applications are interacting with the schedulers. Um, do can we can we maybe force the ISVs to adopt a little bit as well, or not a little bit? Maybe a big uh, make a big big leap frog uh, forward. I mean, it's. We are looking into all the 
services that support the application, but the application might want to, should also adopt a little bit to the new ecosystem. And we, we have PMI that helps with that, but the application, did they do anything in the recent past to, uh, to adopt to new ecosystems? Yeah, if you see Cray Shasta platform, it is it has Kubernetes. Uh, IBM is investing really heavily on Kubernetes. Uh, well, HP bought Cray, so HP now has Shasta. Shasta has Kubernetes. So yeah, that's, ISVs are investing in new ecosystems. That's the system vendors. I mean, the ISVs like Ansys or or like Fluent or something like that. The applications. Yeah, I, I mean from. You know, from my perspective, I haven't seen a lot of IS, true ISVs even adopt, you know, containers as being their sort of distribution model. It's left to third party vendors to do that bundling. I would like to see more, you know, of the ISVs to actually say, here's a container and it comes straight from them, right? You know, this is it. Um, and, and if they were doing that, here's also a, a Kubernetes deployment file to spin it up on Kubernetes. Um, today, I have not seen any of that sort of work go on. Um, you know, NVIDIA does a good job. They have the NVIDIA Cloud Library that they have lots of HPC applications. But I think, and maybe CJ could, could talk, I, I, I think NVIDIA has done a lot of bundling for them. Um, I don't know whether they've actually gone off and done it themselves. Yeah, we, uh, when it's open source uh, or it's licensed, um, I'll take Gromax, for example, we can't touch it. So we require, we can't do anything, and we will help, advise, consult, or whatever, but they're the ones that have to create the container. Um, there are other cases that have a different, more liberal license where we can and have uh, gone in and done things ourselves. Um, so we, and we create you know, places where people can upload their own in um, private sections of the registry as well for their own use. Mm -hmm. And, and part of what we do and add the value with is that we also validate it to make sure that it actually works in our environments. And that's uh, and um, we also you know provide signing and other uh, kinds of facilities to make sure that you know this is the real thing. You're getting it from the right place. Um, we try to keep up with um, uh, you know places where there are errors and security holes and that kind of stuff and uh, regularly run checks on them and that kind of thing, so. Shane thinks it's a failure that ISVs haven't embraced containers more as a way to distribute the application. Uh, but who's yeah. teaching them? I think, like, uh, I'm not sure if Burak is online. But he's he joined the panel, but I think he could talk a little bit to ISVs and his pain. Yeah, I think this lands on yesterday conversation when we were speaking about building containers with proprietary compilers. Like, it's kind of the same conversation. Building containers that comes with a lawyer attached, right? So, <laughs> Uh, lawyers again, no. Oh. Yeah, but from an enterprise perspective, I sadly can't see that either, that there's a large, like like a huge bunch of applications you can get pre-containerized or something. This is just not happening as of now. I mean, just I to elaborate the... on that com comment, it's like, to me, it seems like they should go to it because it gives them more control over how that application gets built and what environment it runs in. It's like, why would they not flock to this? But Maybe it's just a learning curve on their part or, you know, the last mile of how they get that container to the customer or something that's the barrier. I'm not sure what it is, but. Um, well, plus, Shane, plus one, I mean, going to keep doing something until it's too painful to not change, right? <laughs> and from a standpoint, if you can control, if you can accumulate a, a cadre of examples of where uh, debug time and support time were significantly reduced uh, because of it, then people will switch over. And in the meantime, okay. there's a lot of inertia. I mean, Shane, it's a, it's a bit like 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 getting ISVs to move to a cloud license model or something. I think Bura can tell long stories for this over a beer or something. And it just takes time for them to realize that trying something new might be better in the end than, than sticking to what they've always 
like what they've done for the last 20 of years or something. But for, for this, I think I, I had a discussion with a customer when I used to work for Docker and, and this customer had also like code he wanted to license and he was um, saying, okay, it's, it's, I can make sure that the container is able to run and I can even make sure that the container is only running if a certain key is present on the host but the container has no say in whether he wants to run. So I mean, the other way around would, would maybe attractive to be ISVs that they say, if you don't have the license, then the container cannot be started, something like that. So that they can like, maybe it's, it's uh, like that we have an attractive license model for them to get them out of their misery. That's yeah. something you can do, right? Help them with the licensing model. Kind of. If you have a possibility to combine a container with a USB dongle containing the license, they are probably into this as well. <laughs> you know, to maybe respond to my own remark, part of the issue maybe, and I've run into this with some images that we've tried to build for some bioinformatics applications. So they included a tool in it that maybe had an academic only license that you were supposed to go to the, you know, to the, the authors and get permission or whatever which is just annoying, just side comment. But, you know, that may be part of the issue that they're worried about here is like they have a specific part that they developed and but they need to put this in an image that includes all these other tools. And so then what, you know, how do you, what license do you attach to that image and how do you not break, you know, wind up, um, you know, breaking some other rule or something like that. So maybe that's part of the issue. I, I think at the end of the day, just follow the money, right? Whoever's paying them, if they want a container, ask for it. You'll probably get a container. Nobody's probably, or that's probably not happening a whole lot because people don't realize it's a capability they can do. So uh, that's, that's my thought. If, you know, somebody's providing a proprietary tool or software piece, you know, maybe they push back on doing anything that's going to be extra expense for them. but. Yeah, that's true. Okay, ISVs is ticked. Someone else you guys want to touch on? Otherwise, I have one one piece as well. And question, uh, like Chain had a question to the panel. Uh, describe your Nirvana example of how HPC and cloud style workloads would be integrated into a shared system. And what are the gaps to achieve that in your mind? I think we touched on it already. I'm not sure. Um, if we, we finish this off, maybe we can discuss if we did. I, I think one of the things that we've looked at is this, is this hybrid system, right? Where uh, the system can be universal in the types of workloads it wants to run and how that is communicated, right? So uh, we've mocked up some YAML files at one point to say, this is the schedule I want to use and you give it more HPC look and feel. Um, talk about cause and affinity in there. So, for, you know, from, from what we're trying to get to is a way, a descriptive way, and settle on a language, whether it's the common workflow definition language, but settle on a language where you can describe the job in, in terms of probably like a Kubernetes job, like network, storage, job, container, arguments, and have a way of just submitting that and the job is specific enough to decide which, you know, today, which schedule it wants to use. Does it want to use, you know, the HPC scale-out scheduler or the orchestrated service type scheduler and bring together those, 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 two, those two different execution paradigms in a, in a simple way. Because writing, you know, 80 lines of YAML to do an MPI run is sort of like nuts. Um, we, as a community, we have to do better than that. That's one of the reasons why I like Argo, because a lot of that stuff is hidden and it's batch-like syntax, but still there's an awful lot of YAML floating around and it's too much. Um, so for me, it's, it's having a, a more descriptive high-level language that we can describe workflows and jobs. That's, that I think is a, is a main impediment we have here with these technologies. And do we have such a thing in 
in HPC or is it what uh, Holger described, just one bash script that hides the complexity? Is this the artifact for workflows or is there something more, more advanced when you have an HPC job that has multiple stages? Is it just that? Yeah, the, the, again, the ones that I've seen, and we've seen some very complicated batch workflows, uh, sorry, batch submission scripts. They're not just a few lines long. You know, they're, they're very complicated. Um, and I think that's part of the impediment of moving to an orchestration, right? They don't want to take that engineering task of recasting that to, to another language, even if it can do it. Um, so that's where the workflows come into it, these workflow engines. I think that they're going to be more and more important as as, as we move forward. Um, but I need a, a nicer way of describing workflows. Right? And, and it's In my mind, it's not there yet. But. That's my take anyway. OK. I think Burak is back. Maybe do we want to get his comment on ISVs and how they are rejecting of changing and how we can force them to change by maybe offering a better licensing model to them? Um, yeah, sure. Can, can you throw the question at me, um, Christian? Yeah, we just talked about we talked about the scheduling, we talked about workflows, but I think what we what we missed was or what we briefly touched on or what we, we touched on what what we would like to have your take on is how can we make ISVs do a better job and how do do we are we leaving them off the hook by by not forcing them to adjust to this new paradigm of containers and workflow orchestration? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, this is not happening to the ISVs for the first time. They they had other technological shifts in the past, and what has happened is over time they reacted to it as long as it's in their financial interest, right? They're just like any other organization. They're they're governed by financial interest. Um, the uh, the thing that's making it very difficult for ISVs to React has some technological um, uh, touch points. For example, um, companies require ISVs to have proper license management, right? It's These are commercial tools. Well, they rely on third parties for the management of their licenses. And a lot of those tools that they rely on have not made the switch. So just to show an example, um, it's like saying um, if MPI didn't run properly on containers and you ask the ISVs to fix it, they wouldn't be able to fix that either. So we go ahead and we figure out how to make MPI work properly. Well, same thing applies here. Unless we can give them ways to make licensing work properly, they cannot easily migrate. And that's just one example. Um, so it's flexible then. For example, yeah, there are there are five others, uh, but FlexLM is one of the dominant ones. Um, and not only did the conversion didn't quite happen towards, um, let's say, containers, it didn't quite happen towards cloud in some cases. Um, and just saying uh, vendors like FlexLM don't know what they are doing is not doing it any justice either because they are tied to legal agreements. And some of these legal agreements even write down how many miles the user can be away from the server. I'm not joking. So, Sad lawyers. but true. Yeah. <laughs> Sad but true. Um, and, and, and it's not that lawyers did this um, on their own. It was attached to business practices. So now you're in a complex business technology legal uh, triangle. So. Um, migration to cloud, migration to containers for ISVs is not as easy as it sounds. Um, it, it is challenging. I have seen every major ISV make great efforts towards uh, figuring out how to help their customers get to cloud. So it's not that they're not doing anything. They are trying to find ways. I've even seen license files. Guys, I'm not joking about this. I've seen license files with which are universal, 
basically what they're saying is, you know what, I trust you, use my software, whichever way you like, it, just so that their users can get to cloud. So it, they are stuck between a rock and a hard place. But Burak, uh, remember how long it took them? Yeah, it took um, five plus years to, to do anything special with cloud. Yeah. Okay, that's um, that, that story. Can we like move to a more uplifting one, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we are like, we have a couple of minutes left, but we, we, if, you, if we have something to discuss, we of course can continue. I have one thing that I would like to ask Paolo and I think also the rest of the panelists. Um, the question for for NextFlow and SnakeMake, I think, and for most of the genomics pipelines, they are taking ownership of workflow scheduling and just hand off task management to backends like AWS Badge, Google, thing and, and, and also local or, or Docker execution. And um, I'm not sure how this how this goes with, with other tools, but is this something that um, we will see see changing that we that we the, the that the back end is not just the task execution and scheduling piece, but more hand it over to hand it over more uh, complexity and more um, yeah, more more things to handle than than just one single task, but um, maybe make use of more of those those backends. If you you know what I mean. Like for those pipeline tools, you define a workflow. The workflow defines tasks, and the tasks are handed over to the backends. So the question is, like, who's in charge again? Like, can you hand off more to the to the schedulers? Can you um, is it always next door that needs to be in charge of uh, supervising the task at the end? And maybe that's a curveball question and we should ask something else. But <laughs> Just say, I mean, I feel like that's not a, a bad sort of separation of concerns. I think it can be a, a good model. I think I've seen cases where, you know, that interaction between the two can be hard to optimize, right? So, for example, um, personal experience, we've used like Cromwell and WDL, and Cromwell has a way to submit to Slurm, but it kind of assumes like the, through, the turnaround is going to be pretty fast. And so if it's kind of submitting jobs as one step finishes and it submits the next, then you can start to get into, you're waiting through the queue to work through the queue multiple iterations, right? And so then you wind up doing stupid things like having another queue system that you submit into the HPC system to kind of keep the nodes active and all. So I feel like there's still some serious gaps here, but um, you know, it's not necessarily with just the, the workflow engine or even that separation, it's just in kind of the execution model assumptions. I think it's a limitation in the batch schedulers too, right? Um, you know. Yeah, I, I see as well uh, an increased need for, for this, this kind of tools in the meaning that uh, there is the need to, to separate the workflow logic from the deployment logic. So where, uh, where you are going to, to deploy this workflow because you want to make this workflow portable. And here the, the challenge is then how to, to make it to, to find a good compromise between the abstraction and the execution. So coming back to to, to your your question, I think there is even more need to optimize than this this work, workflow on the backend side. So from the batch scheduler side, because to to have a good abstraction, you on the on the, 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 the runtime engine from the workflow engine, you need to you don't have a complete control on some low level details. And these low level details are delegated to the, the green engine, basically. Okay. So I see a growing need to optimize the, this kind of workflow on the backend side. Okay, cool. That's something to work on then. 
Maybe as a as a conclusion or as a as a last question to all of you, and, and Eduardo gave his 2025 prediction, but maybe what is the prediction for next year's orchestration segment? Are we getting closer? I think. Are we seeing more Argo and Airflow? What do you What do you think, or do we see any any change? Well, what is your prediction? And this would be the the closing round, basically. So, who wants to start? Maybe Bill goes last because he already talked about this. Andy, Andrew. I I can go first and make a request. I'd like to have somebody show me how to submit. You know what? What I think of today as a job in a Kubernetes workflow, along with a service component, I'd, I'd love to see that next year in detail. Please. Okay, it's good. Challenge accepted. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, something that was touched in the chat is I would like to see a bigger and more diverse community and projects from both sides of the community coming into this workshop. That's what I want to see next year. OK. Did I say like wish list a prediction? But anyhow, yeah, no, wish list is fine as well. <laughs> Painful silence. Um, we'll have systems out uh, this year and next year, which which are hybrid. So you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be interested in seeing how customers are going to use those systems and what type of feature requests we get. You know, so so um, that's a, you know, 2021 sort, sort of prediction is, is with these systems being on, on people's floors, what type of workloads, how are they going to use them, what issues are they going to see that we didn't see in just uh, on, on delivering the software. So um, this is where the theory actually meets the road. So um, that'll be, it'll be interesting. That was going to be my remark as well as like, we should have systems that start to really give us a playground for some of these things. And I'm, I'm with you, Bill. I'm, I'm kind of wondering how it's going to, how, how, what we're going to do and what, you know, snags we're going to hit. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. I've, I've certainly seen with the introduction of orchestration and cloud native stacks, um, the introduction of very interesting workloads and, and, and possibilities here. So, um, as I said, we, you know, we have, you know, ML steering of HPC simulations coming, um, this combination of the, the different programming models and, and how they get used will be, will be uh, the next frontier. Right. Yeah. To make this a wish, to make this a wish list, I'd I'd also like to see this, like just what people are doing with with the tools we give them, be it either Kubernetes on an HPC environment or Slurm in rather Kubernetes environment, and just see what type of work, workloads the people came up with. Yeah, and um, my prediction is um, because high performance computing represents um, such a diverse set of verticals. Um, I, uh, I'm anticipating the cloud providers as well as um, other technology providers who, who provide Kubernetes-like uh, environments to take notice of HPC uh, workloads and offer those additional capabilities into their uh, offerings so that HPC workloads can run on uh, Kubernetes properly. Um, currently to the state, we're lacking some very simple, uh, or I shouldn't call them simple, um, foundational basic elements such as device support. And there you go, you can you can properly fully utilize uh, Kubernetes. I, I expect that to get fixed in the next 12 months. And um, my predi my prediction is that is um, really need for Portable container image description and building on fly because there is a more and more request for uh, uh, com uh, containerized computation and having to manage different 
container image for the same workflow. So there, there is a growing need also to manage the, the, the assembly and the building for this container on fly. Where is CJ? I think we'll CJ. I'll just add that I think driving this with real uh, real applications and situations where we really need orchestration and need, uh, need it to solve real problems is really important. I'll touch on some of those tomorrow. All right, cool. Any other closing remarks? Otherwise, I think we can call it a day and uh, wrap up, and or we already wrapped up, and we can, uh, yeah, have a nice day, everyone. And then uh, we can just conclude. Guys, happy to, uh, for the second day, I think it was awesome. And um, yeah, we see each other tomorrow again for the last day, HPC specific and um, use cases and outlooks. So that's going to be fun as well. Thanks, everyone. Right. Have a nice Looking forward to it. Bye. Bye. Bye.